Hello everyone. In today's video, we're going to be learning about the propeller pitch control on a Beechcraft G58. Now, the propeller pitch control is uh, not the most complicated tool, but a lot of people have a lot of questions on it, so I thought it might be a good idea to go ahead and take a look at it. So what is the propeller pitch handle? Well, it's this little blue knob that you've probably seen on a different aircraft. If you've ever just grabbed it and started cranking around with it when we're just sitting on the ground, you probably didn't notice much of a change of anything. And you're probably wondering what it is and what it does. Basically, what this does is this sets the maximum RPM that the engine can turn at by adjusting the propeller pitch. That is the actual blade angle you have on a given engine. Now, for example, if I went to go ahead and shut this engine off real quickly, I'll let it go ahead and spool down. Shouldn't take too, too long. There it goes. You'll notice if I grab this blue handle now and start cranking on it, absolutely nothing happens. You're probably sitting there going, I thought it was supposed to adjust the pitch of the blade. It does when the engine is moving. The actual mechanism for it uses basically oil pressure, which of course is dependent on engine speed and load, as well as counterweights to go ahead and actually change these blade pitches in order to keep this engine moving at a specific speed. So I'm going to go ahead and restart that engine real quick. Very nice. So what that means for us is that we can keep the engine running at an optimum RPM for cru cruise and climb, as well as be able to change that RPM dynamically in order to meet different conditions. It also gives us a really, really wonderful ability to what they call feather, which is going to be going ahead and taking the propeller blades and making them so that they do not windmill in the event that we have an engine out, which we'll go ahead and try out once we get flying. So when we're taking off, we always want to make sure that the blue handle or the propeller control is set to maximum RPM. We want this set up so that we can get the maximum power on an engine. Now, if you had an engine curve, you were taking a look at the torque curve on it. If you want to imagine, if you were to pull that handle down, you'd prevent it from ever getting to the point where it produces its maximum horsepower. Generally, once we get airborne, we pull it back a little bit in order to do our climb. And of course, when we do our actual cruising, we want to manipulate that as well. So let's go ahead and get things started. And we'll take a look once we get airborne. Go ahead and gently push the power up. Now notice, until you get to a certain level of RPM, the governor doesn't actually kick in and start adjusting the different angle of that particular propeller. But now if you take a look in the bottom right, you can see that it has stabilized at 2,700 RPM, which is essentially the red line of this plane. Now, there's a bunch of different times when you're going to want to be manipulating that propeller control. The most common, like I said, is either going to be climb and especially during cruise. Now, turboprop aircraft have a slightly different personality when it comes to manipulating that particular control. Let's go ahead and bring up the landing gear now that we have a positive rate of climb. We're in Brazil today, by the way, and now the weather's supposed to be a little bit bumpy, so that should make things a little bit more interesting for us, which is awesome. So now that we've gotten airborne, there's basically two different accepted uses for the propeller. We could actually leave it alone right now, which of course would enable us to continue cruising at maximum power, or we can actually gently reduce it to 2,500 RPM. Again, reducing that RPM is going to bring down cabin noise in the real world, and it's also going to save us a little bit of fuel if we're not in the biggest hurry, since the engine is not going to be producing its full power. The consequence of which, of course, is that when you do reduce that RPM, you're not going to be traveling or climbing nearly as quickly. So if we wanted to go ahead and do a maximum performance climb in this particular aircraft, we basically have everything set up ready to go now. If we wanted to do that reduced climb, we'd simply very, very smoothly move that blue handle backwards until we can see our RPM there on the right comes down to 2,500. Now, what we're doing right now is we're basically restricting that oil flow, which is causing that propeller blade to actually go to a coarse pitch. It's actually, if we were to look at it in slow motion, you'd see the whole thing twisting so that it's now digging more of the air, which has reduced the speed of our engine. I'm going to go ahead and take a nice little gentle right turn here. In doing so, we've significantly reduced cabin noise, and like I said, we're saving a little bit of fuel, but we're definitely going to be hurting our speed a little bit because of that. Now, different aircraft have different rules when it comes to when you can do that during a climbing situation. This particular aircraft, the POH, does allow us to do that. Folks of you who like to fly the Textron the G58, you also have that ability. Folks who fly the Diamond as well also have that capability to actually dynamically adjust it. Now, if you fly the Cirrus, you have an interesting situation where you actually do have a controllable speed propeller. However, you can't actually control it directly. You only have a unified power handle is what they call it. So let's go ahead and increase the uh, RPM again. You always want to do it very smoothly because if you do it too aggressively, you run the risk of overspeeding the engine. Again, just a dip. See how it oversped a little bit? I haven't actually pushed the handle all the way forward yet. Go ahead and bring it back just a teeny tiny bit to get it back to 2700. Keep in mind, one of the big things you're trying to avoid is overspeeding that engine because you can do a lot of damage to it if you let it do so. So let's go ahead and get ourselves a little bit of altitude. Again, I'll go back up to that maximum performance climb that I was using a minute ago. 
I should be concentrating more on flying than uh, go ahead and do this little zigzag of my uh, cruise position here. This aircraft, by the way, can climb at a much, much higher speed if it needs to do so. The reason I'm not right now is because I really don't find it very comfortable to be flying an aircraft at, you know, 17 degrees in this kind of weather. It just seems like it's kind of bad practice. All right, we're going to go ahead and continue climbing for a little while. And once we get up to a little bit of altitude, we'll take a look at the other features of that particular propeller. Wow, this thing can climb like a rocket. We're not very well weighed down today, so it doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Now, in the old days, propellers actually, the uh, controllable pitch propellers, I should say, were a little different. You actually manipulated the angle of the blades by hand to set your RPM, much like the collective control on a helicopter. Now, this is a very, very different set of rules that we'd have to be following if that were the case, in which case you'd have to be much, much more on top of things. But realistically, once you set it to the RPM that you want it to climb at or to cruise at, it's going to stay at that RPM unless there's a serious wind gust, or, uh, gust I should say, sorry or massive change of power. So again, we're just taking it up nice and gentle on our own. I'm going to flip on the automatic pilot in a minute once we get to a nice safe altitude. Mm, that's looking pretty darn good. We're going to level off at about 6,500 feet. It's really hoping to break through these clouds, but we're actually using real-world weather today, so it kind of doesn't surprise me that we're not breaking through very easily here. Just a little bit higher. I always forget that the Beechcraft G58, you have to fly slightly nose up at this weight, but it's nothing too, too bad. A little bit higher. And go ahead and at the altitude hold, 6,500 feet. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and flip on our nav hold as well. Might as well get it actually flying us. And now we'll take a look at the next phase. So now what we want to do is we want to get the aircraft into a cruising condition. And again, you're going to want to take a look at the POH with the acceptable combinations of power, which is going to be manifold pressure, and RPM, which is going to be RPM. Generally, what you can see is a combination of either 25 RPM, or 25 in the manifold pressure, and 2500 RPM. Or, in this case, since we're a little bit too high for that, you'd actually see something like a 23 and a 25. Generally, whatever is in this little green box is considered an acceptable RPM. So, for example, let's say we wanted to do 21 on the manifold pressure, and we wanted to do 2400 RPM. That's a relatively quiet cruise. The first thing we're going to do is reduce throttle. So I'm going to go ahead and back my throttle up just a teeny tiny bit. I don't have the world's smoothest throttle here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to gently reduce the RPM. Notice we changed our throttle setting before we changed our RPM setting. This is a great way to pre prevent damage. We're going to go all the way down to about 2300. And again, since we're in the green for this aircraft and the POH says that this is an acceptable combination, we can go ahead and use it. Now that I've got my manifold pressure set and my RPM set, I can actually go ahead and start leaning out the mixture a teeny tiny bit. In this case, we're looking pretty good as far as that goes. And then we're all set. So now let's go ahead and take a look. Yeah, we're just a little high, but that's okay. It's a little windy today, so it doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Maybe a little higher than that. Again, I have a little teeny tiny wheel on my joystick I use for that, so it's kind of tricky to use. So now that we're all set, we can go ahead and just cruise right through this uh, terrifying thunderstorm, not having to really worry about this again until we go down. Now, let's say that we have an engine failure during flight, and we'll go ahead and simulate an engine failure the old-fashioned way. Normally, if you had a non-controllable speed propeller, the moment you had that engine failure, the propeller blade would actually still be relatively flat to the air. It would start windmilling and creating a tremendous amount of drag. So let's go ahead and create that engine failure failure. So the engine immediately starts to slow down. I'm not going to adjust my prop pitch at this time. Now remember, well, we'll deal with uh, twin engine planes on another day, but remember if you have a dead foot, you have a dead engine. In this case, the entire aircraft is pulling itself very aggressively to the right here. And if we were to do something silly like increasing the power on this one, the whole aircraft would twist even more aggressively in that direction. So you're probably noticing this engine is now completely disengaged. As a matter of fact, I'm going to come over here and set the magneto to off. And you see how the engine is still spinning. It's doing what they call windmilling. This is bad news for us because it creates a lot of drag and we already have enough drag as it is. So what we can do now is we can actually take the propeller handle and pull it all the way back. 
What this is going to do is it's going to cause the pitch of the propeller to switch from that kind of flat fine pitch to a much, much more coarse pitch so that it basically streamlines with the actual air coming to it. As a result, it doesn't have nearly as much drag as it does on the actual aircraft itself. There's no reason for that to be all the way up. I'll go ahead and pull that one back as well. Make sure when you're practicing these things, by the way, that you don't accidentally pull the handle that you actually need. So now because we've changed the propeller RPM, or should say the propeller blade angle, it is not slowing us down nearly as bad as it would be if we left the blue handle all the way forward and had that nice and regular pitch. So again, it's a spectacular way to do it. Now, if you're on a turboprop aircraft, this is pretty much your primary method to help reduce that uh, stress there. You can see my uh, engine, my nose is starting to sneak up more and more and more and more, which doesn't surprise me because of the fact we're slowing down. Let's go ahead and restart that engine. We'll take a look at the next phase of flight here. Go ahead and increase this. We're always going to do uh, RPM before we do anything else. Crack the throttle just a teeny tiny bit. As soon as we crank this thing, we want to be very gentle because now it's going to be a little bit slow. Again, we can just give it just a teeny, teeny, tiny crank. We don't have to jam on it or anything like that on account of the fact that the engine's already pretty much started. Give it just a little tiny bit of throttle. And we're just going to smoothly bring it back up. You don't want to jam on it too hard because if you do so, you're basically going to overspeed the engine as everything has to start catching up to again. So we're going to go ahead and gently increase that again until we get just about where we were a minute ago at about 23. Perfect. Okay. So what's the other functions of that? We'll wait for our aircraft, of course, to speed up a little bit now that we've been awfully abusing to this particular system. Now, what are other uses for this handle? Well, let's say we want to make the aircraft descend. You know, we're in a fairly mountainous region here, so descents are going to be pretty dangerous. One of the things we can do is we can actually reduce the RPM to prevent our engine from overspeeding speeding in the descent. Now let's say we did something really absurd here, like let's set my altitude to 4,500 feet. Then we're gonna go ahead and set this flight level change mode on. And I'm actually just going to go ahead and use vertical speed, nose down, down, down. We'll do a thousand feet per minute and I'm not gonna to touch anything. Now watch what happens. First of all, airspeed is gonna start cranking up. Second, our RPM is going to start cranking up because of the fact that the air hitting the blade can actually speed things up. We're basically unloading the engine right now. But you're noticing, even though we're diving, we're actually not changing in RPM. Because right now the propeller blades are slowly twisting themselves in order to take a bigger chunk out of that air to prevent that engine from getting any faster than it is that it was before. Another thing worth noting is my manifold pressure is slowly creeping up upwards on account of the fact, you know, I'm descending here. So as a result, we're going to go a little bit faster, the air is going to get thicker, and I'm going to be able to produce more power. So that's another solid method. So let's go ahead and level the aircraft off at 5,500 and pretend we're going to be landing the plane. We've got a bit of a long journey here, so I'm not going to be flying the whole journey. Let's go ahead and press the altitude button once we cross 5,500 feet. Delightful. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and increase my power just a teeny tiny bit. Now here's one of the dangers, and you're going to hear all about this probably from other folks who told- Whoa, that was a close one. From other folks as well. And that's that you never want to be in a situation where your manifold pressure is very high and your RPM is very low. When you do that, you tend to cause your oil pressure to spike. Anybody who's ever driven a standard automatic, or standard car I should say, and they put it in the sixth gear and try to get started on a hill, you've experienced that exact thing, pretty much exactly like that. So you want to be very cautious about that kind of a situation. So let's say we're going to go ahead and land the plane. Um, we'll say we're coming into an approach. I've got about 22 inches. Oh, about 20 inches is probably pretty good. Now, when we do our approach, we want to actually increase our RPM because remember, when you increase the RPM, the blades are going to take a less chunk out of the air, which is going to make the whole system act like a giant speed break on descent. Whoa, that was a close one. So because of that, that's going to give us that extra bit of slowdown that we need in order to safely land the plane. It's a great technique. But now what do we do to bring our RPM back up? Well, we're going to do the reverse of what we did before. So the first thing we're going to do is, again, we're just going to pretend that we're landing the plane. We're going to increase our RPM first. Again, you want to do this very smoothly because you don't want to do it too quickly. Otherwise, you're going to run into the problem that you're going to overspeed the engine. Give it just a moment to stabilize because it's going to tend to go smacking right into the limiter. Whoop, there it is. And then you're going to smoothly increase your manifold pressure. This prevents you from running into that situation that I mentioned where you're going to have a very high manifold pressure and a very low RPM. 
and that's all there basically is to it. So now if we were to land the plane or something like that, it would just simply be a matter of lining ourselves up, sticking it down on the ground, and we'd be in pretty good shape as well. Now, something you probably heard before is moving both of these handles together. There were actually some World War II planes that were configured. I know the P-47 later model certainly was, where you actually had a bar that would connect the blue handle, your propeller control, with the throttle control at the same time. So if you push one to forward, both of them came together for it as well. This is not an uncommon practice as long as you do it smoothly. So again, we'll go ahead and reverse things. First things first, I'm going to go ahead and reduce my manifold pressure, just like I said before. And let's go ahead and reduce our RPM back down to 2,500. Again, just be nice and gentle. You can actually hold your mouse over it and uh, use your mouse wheel if you want to slow it down a little bit. Again, as long as we're in the green and as long as we're following the rules in the book, we don't have to worry about it too, too much. That looks pretty good. Now, let's say it was an emergency situation and we needed maximum power. Now, if we push these two together like this, You'll notice we have that emergency power, and because they were matched to each other, we didn't overread the engine badly, but we still overread that engine a little bit, which is going to be very, very dangerous. Now, if we were in a more extreme situation, again, I'm going to be a little abusive to this engine. Again, I always reduce my power before I reduce my pitch. Let's say I go all the way down to something like 2,300 RPM. Again, all we're doing is increasing the pitch. That looks good here. Now, if I wanted to, I could go ahead and increase both those at the same time in an absolute emergency situation. What we wouldn't want to do, though, is do one of those, because, again, then you run into the situation where you have that high manifold pressure, low RPM. We'd simply do the two together. And now as we do this, you're going to see us over rev a little bit, but you notice that it was able to catch it because that power and that pitch basically came in together and kept everything nice and smooth. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at another interesting situation. Let's say you ran into a situation where one of these suddenly went like this. What does that mean? That means basically the propellers decided to go straight course. Now, when we do this, in the real world, it's going to make your oil pressure freak out, which you can see very distinctively, and it's basically going to cause that engine to slowly explode on you. If that were to happen, of course, you'd want to shut that engine down as quickly as you can to prevent doing any real damage to it. Again, don't be the one who pulls down the wrong handle when you're trying to solve a situation like that. Now, the nice thing is if I want to fix that, I can just go ahead and do one of these real fast, bring the RPM back in, and then very, very smoothly bring the throttle back in to go ahead and get it to what we had just a moment ago. If you hit that too hard, though, you're going to over rev it and you're going to damage your engine. So again, you want to be very cautious with that. Real aircraft tend to be a little bit more precise, like you're not as likely to go over in the RPM, but it certainly does happen from time to time. All right, hopefully this is helpful. Again, it's just kind of taking a look at some of the different features of a constant speed propeller. The most important thing to remember is when you're reducing engine power, always do black handle before blue handle. When you're increasing engine power, you always do blue handle before black handle. Don't forget, if you do have a dead engine, you can pull one of these handles of the dead engine, please all the way back to go ahead and cause it to feather. And if you are in a turboprop situation, changing the blue handle doesn't really change your thrust. All it really does is change the amount of noise that the aircraft is making. Because again, a lot of these are free turbine turboprops, so you don't really have a lot of those issues linked to it. I would always take a look at the POH for every aircraft. There are definitely different suggestions, but if you're looking for a general rule of thumb, as long as you keep everything in the green, you'll probably be safe. But remember, you can only make full power if you're at max RPM and max manifold pressure. Enjoy.